All right, guys, welcome to EMS Challenge. Uh, thank you, Centerpoint, for hosting us. This is the first uh, class of the month. We're at Centerpoint today. A couple of quick things. Uh, first thing, exciting news, we've got Dr. Tether Payne speaking today and also Dr. Joel Evans, UAB faculty, so that's fantastic. Um, update, system entry. If you're gonna put somebody in the STEMI stroke or trauma system, do it on scene. In today's world, we got a lot of diversion, a lot of issues in hospitals, overcrowding, so know where you go before you start booking there. So put them in the system pretty quick. Quick updates on educational opportunities. We'll be in Prattville on the 24th, um, hosted by the Prattville Fire Department, sponsored by Alabama Fire College. Um, we'll do chest trauma lectures and then some case studies. Dr. Rose will be there with us. And then from one to three, we're gonna do a skill station. We'll have Megaco training, uh, pick through CPR, some advanced airway. Um, Dr. Julie Brown will be there with me as well. We'll even have, uh, hopefully have some pick trade to do surgical airways. So some cool stuff come out to Prattville. Um, CCTMC is a critical care transport conference. It's a national conference. Um, it's actually in Orange Beach this year, which is pretty cool. It's in May. Um, it's at the Perdidio Beach Resort. Rooms are pretty cheap. Um, if you want good Con Ed on a national level, great place to go, but it's really close. Um, I guess the last thing is I want to announce that, you know, I've been talking for years about the EMS Fellowship. Uh, we were approved in January, uh, and we actually have our first two fellows that have been hired. Uh, Dr. Uh, what's your name again? <laughs> Dr. Taylor Payne uh, and Dr. Julie Brown are our first two fellows. So we're going to have two docs who would be board certified in emergency medicine out there in the field doing EMS stuff. Um, we're working on some vehicles for field response to other things, but it's pretty exciting stuff. So thanks for your help, guys. I appreciate that. And I'll leave you alone, Dr. Payne. Sure. It's all you, sir. All right. All right. You got me? Okay, perfect. Hey guys, I uh, just want to uh, thank you all for the opportunity to coming out and speak again uh, with you. I'm going to be talking about ENT emergencies. So let me see if I can get this, make sure we're working here. Wrong button. Left, right, arrow is probably the best bet on the keyboard. On the keyboard, you think? All right, we'll do that. Okay. So there's a, you know, there's a lot to cover here with ENT emergencies. Um, it's, you know, of course, a broad topic. Where I'm, when I was making this lecture, I really just thought of the things that could be really high yield for the, the pre-hospital setting and things you should know. Um, this is not going to be comprehensive. I'm not going to go over every single ENT issue. Uh, but yeah, hopefully we'll have some fun along the way. So ENT, one of the first things we'll talk about is the nose, specifically epistaxis. We see a, a fair amount of it. Uh, especially with how many people now are on anticoagulation. So we'll talk about it. We'll talk about some of the reasons um, for it and some of the different management techniques, especially in the pre-hospital setting uh, that you can do out in the field. We're going to talk about a whole different section about uh, ENT trauma later on in this section. So we'll hold off any kind of nose injuries until then. So let's talk about epistaxis. Um, it's very common. Most don't require any kind of ER management. You know, people have these at home all the time and, and usually can deal with them fine. Um, the thing is, though, if they're calling you, they're calling the ambulance most of the time, they're having issues controlling it, uh, either because they have other comorbidities, they might be an ESRD patient and their platelets aren't working or they're on uh, Eliquis or, or what have you. So um, it's good to kind of think about these things and think about what, what the different options are. I'm going to go into some of the different techniques we use in the ER um, as well, just to give you kind of information about what we do. So just so everybody knows, there's two really different kinds of epistaxis. There's anterior and posterior, okay? The posterior epistaxis is, is more rare. It's about 10% of the nose bleeding that you have, but it's very difficult to control, okay? These are the ones that you really can't see the bleeding that well inside the nair, um, and it bleeds more down the throat, and it's just really difficult to, uh, to manage. Um, the anterior ones are the most common, okay? It's from this little area of blood vessel called the Kesselbeck, Kesselbeck plexus. Um, and of course, most of these are just caused by direct trauma, okay? Over 80% is just nose picking direct trauma. You can get it if somebody has bad sinusitis, if they have some kind of um, uh, tumor in, of the nose, you can get this as well. Um, like I said, most of it is anterior um, nose bleeding. 
So again, the vast majority of these can be handled with direct pressure. Okay, that's kind of what everybody knows how to do. Direct pressure with your fingers over the nares, kind of leaning forward in what we call the sniffing position. Okay, a lot of people want to tilt their head back. Okay, that's just going to put all the blood in the back of their throat. That's going to cause them to, to gag and cough, which is going to cause them to clear out whatever clot they've already made. So it's always important to tell patients to lean forward. If you have a stretcher, sit all the way up and have them leaning forward and just direct pressure right on the nares there. Okay. This is the sniffing position I was talking about. So even if somebody comes directly, walks up in the waiting room with a uh, epistaxis, the first thing we do is just direct pressure, okay? Direct pressure for a good 10 to 15 minutes without peaking, okay? No, no removing and seeing if it stopped for a good 15 minutes solid, okay? Um, some people, you know, may or may not tolerate this well. There's a little trick uh, where you can take two tongue depressors and just tape them together, and that can be kind of to sit on their nose and keep it applied so the patient doesn't have to hold their nose the whole time. Um, so that's a little trick. That's the first thing we always do. We try that for 15 minutes. If it's still bleeding, then we'll kind of move on to the next things. It's always good just to try to get a little history on them, see if they're on any blood thinners, to see if they have history of a recurrent nosebleed, see if they've ever had to you know, had to go in for any kind of surgery on their nose for nose bleeding in the past. So like I said, direct pressure is always the first uh, go-to management item. If this doesn't work, we, uh, we can spray in the Afrin, which you can get Afrin over the counter. We have it in the ER or phenylephrine spray. Uh, I believe phenylephrine is over the counter as well, so some, some patients have this at home. But all it is is a couple sprays each side and then direct pressure again and then 15 minutes again without looking, okay? Now that will solve probably about 80% of nose bleeds we see. If that doesn't work, usually patients are on blood thinners or other, or other comorbidities and it's going to cause it to be a little more severe. So we have uh, TXA spray um, or you can use nebulized TXA. Um, we have little atomizers in the ER that we just spray both sides just like the Afrin and we do the same thing. We wait 15 minutes. Now, if it hasn't resolved by that time, um, then most of the time these patients are going to need packing. Um, so there's a couple different commercial products we use. There's a Rhino Rocket, which is probably the most common. There's the Mur Muracell, um, which all, all these are is basically a device that tamponizes the nose bleeding inside the nose. You can coat it in some type of TXA or some sort of um, a thrombotic agent is what we usually do and we stick it in. This will usually take care of pretty much anything, okay? Uh, the only caveat being that if it is a posterior nosebleed, um, there's a couple different packing uh, items that we can use to get far enough back, but it can be difficult to get all the way back to the posterior bleed. So there's a little different trick to do that. But this will pretty much solve most everybody, and we send these people home with this. We stick them in their nose, blow it up, and then they just have them follow up with the ENT specialist in a couple days, and they usually do fine with it. So that's really the, the most important thing. Um, I would say these can be pretty dramatic sometimes. Um, patients can be coughing, gagging, throwing up. Um, so just be expecting that when you see them. Um, you know, most, most overall, they don't require any kind of blood transfusions or anything where they lose a massive amount. I'll just talk about the ear real quick. There's not a, a ton of like ear emergencies that, you know, it, that we could intervene on it in the pre-hospital setting, but there's a couple I wanted y'all to know about. One is the auricular hematoma and then a perforated TEM you might see occasionally people call ambulance for. So auricular hematoma, um, I'm sure you've heard of this, but it's just uh, basically a collection of blood in the top part of the ear. Um, this, this leads to, if this is not taken care of correctly, at least a cauliflower ear, we see a lot of wrestlers have. And basically what it is, is there's on the ear right here, there is basically just skin perichondrium, which is just the tissue surrounding the cartilage and then the cartilage itself. There's no kind of fatty tissue in between. So any kind of trauma can separate those two layers, the perichondrium from the cartilage, and that disrupts all the blood supply to the cartilage. So the cart cartilage actually dies, and that's what gives you all the deformities. So this is just an example you have all seen before, the, the cauliflower ear. This is from a non-treated uh, uh, auricular hematoma. So to treat it, you just have to drain it. Um, which in the ER, we just make a small incision all the way kind of around the curvature of the ear, and then it's got to have some kind of packing in place because as soon as you drain it, it'll just reaccumulate fluid. So we'll we'll put sometimes a little uh, packing like this on the right and sew it through to keep it flat. Sometimes you can just do a direct pressure on the side. Uh, perforated TEM, um, most commonly caused by uh, trauma. You can see it in, with barotrauma, like scuba diving, sometimes blast injuries, you'll see these as well. It can be an indicator that there's other serious uh, trauma going on if you see one of this in a, a, a blast victim 
So it's just important to keep in mind. Um, they'll usually present with pain, sudden pain, sudden hearing loss. They'll have vertigo occasionally, um, just from if there's any kind of water that enters the, the middle ear there, you can have vertigo with it as well. Um, usually these do well. We have them follow up with the ENT specialist. They'll do a, a audio, you know, they'll send them to audiology and, and make sure all their hearing is appropriate. Usually they, they heal up fine um, without antibiotics or anything like that. All right, let's talk about teeth. So uh, a couple of kind of big topic items as far as teeth. We'll talk about dental fractures themselves, teeth avulsions. Um, and then I've seen a couple of cases of post-teeth uh, uh, extraction bleeding. So we'll kind of go over that a little bit. So tooth fractures themselves, um, the management of these really is going to depend on what portion of the tooth is fractured. OK, and we'll, we'll talk about the different types. I know this, this, this next few slides are painful. Um, all right, so the, it's the management of the, the tooth fractures are basically dependent on what portion of the tooth is fractured. There's a classification system. You really don't have to know it, but basically the farther the fracture goes down and what is involved, the poor outcome that the tooth is going to survive. So if you see class one is just the enamel on top, these do fine. Um, usually the patients are not even complaining about anything unless there's a little sharp edge sometimes we'll file it down just so it doesn't cause trauma to the other uh, portions of the mouth. Class two uh, is uh, when it involves the dentin which is uh, just this portion here it's just kind of a yellow creamy uh, part of the tooth uh, right above the pulp so these would be class two. Um, usually patients will say yeah it's kind of uh, sensitive to hot and cold um, not as much pain as the class three though. And then the class three is when you have dentin and pulp. So there's a good picture here. So this one in the bottom right, you can kind of see the little area of red. So that's the pulp. That's kind of the tissue that actually gives the tooth uh, all its blood supply. So these are class three uh, fractures. So these require us to put a special kind of like cement paste over them to protect the tooth and protect the pulp. Um, besides doing that and placing the pace. We don't do a lot of other things in the ER. We just have them follow up with dentistry to, to see if there's any any chance of the tooth surviving um, or if they want to, you know, put in um, other teeth for cosmetic reason, reasons. <clears throat> so the tooth avulsion. Um, first off, you'll, you'll see pretty commonly sublux teeth, which is just teeth that are very wiggly after trauma. Usually not a lot to do. They usually do fine. Um, you know, if they're really unstable, in the ER, we can put a splinting material across the, the other teeth beside them to kind of stabilize it until it heals up. But usually the actual root is um, it's not damaged, so they do fine. Now, a vol's tooth is, is kind of a different situation, right? So you, you have the entire tooth that has now come out, OK? So the ideal management of these, and I know it's not always possible, but is to try to re-implant as soon as possible, OK? If you can find the tooth, is to replant it as possible. There's a, um, it's basically time dependent on how well the tooth is going to do based on how quickly you can get it back in. OK, so, you know, if the patient is able to tolerate it, if you have the tooth with you, if you can try to implant it, of course, it's probably going to be impossible in, in younger patients or elderly. You know, if there's any concern for like an airway issue, then don't worry about it. But if feasible, the best thing to do is to go ahead and re-implant the tooth. And it's not it's not going to be stable, of course. So what um, what you can do is just tell them to bite down on a piece of gauze until you get to the ER. That'll kind of keep it stable. And then in the ER, what we'll do is we'll put a little splint across the teeth beside it to keep it in place. Um, if you're unable to do that, you can transport it in one of these different mediums. Hank solution. I, I don't know if, if the EMS actually carries Hank, Hank, Hank solution. I, I didn't think so, but everybody has you know sterile saline. So you can put it in saline milk if you're at a patient's house for some reason. They have milk. You can put it in milk. The important thing you're trying to do is to try to keep the, the end of the root uh, vital because most of these teeth, when they're evolved, it still has a little portion of the root that's left on the tooth. So it, it can dry out within 30 to 45 minutes and kind of be useless. So that's what you're trying to do by putting in this solution is keeping the root of the tooth viable. <clears throat> All right, well, I've seen a couple of cases of these, uh, this uh, post tooth extraction bleeding. Usually they don't have a lot of complications. Um, a lot of patients before they get this, they'll be told to kind of stop their blood thinners beforehand. 
uh, but not, so, you know, some patients aren't always compliant. So we've seen a couple of cases of this recently. Usually um, they do well with direct pressure um, and just like a nosebleed, you can spray some um, afrin in there and kind of put pressure. If you're, if you're, if you're able to atomize um, or nebulize TXA, you can do that as well. Um, but, but otherwise, in the, in the ER, there's a, a couple different things. If we see a bleeder, we can cauterize it, but in the ER, we'll kind of do the same thing, just pressure and different topical agents to see if we can get it stuck. All right, so we'll talk about oral and mouth emergencies. Does anybody know what this might be by any chance, this picture here? It's close to angioedema, it's very, it's very similar. This is actually Ludwig's angina. So this is the double tongue sign is what they call it. So this is, you know, angioedema would be swelling of the tissues. We'll talk about it, but this is Ludwig's angina. So this is a huge swelling and infection of the floor of the mouth caused by just an uncontrolled, usually it starts with a tooth infection. And this can be an uh, airway emergency. These people can progress very quickly. I mean, obviously, we'll show some more pictures, but their, their whole mouth just fills up. Their tongue gets pushed uh, to the, you know, floor of their mouth very quickly. So these can be uh, pretty... Uh, pretty nerve-wracking. You see these walk into the ER. So we'll talk about some uh, infections of the of the uh, oral cavity and neck. We'll talk about some other kind of big topic items, and we'll talk about Ludwig's and angioedema as well. All right. So peritompsal or abscess. Um, Y'all might see, you know, somebody being transferred for this, or you know, I guess somebody could call the 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 ambulance if they're really having a lot of airway difficulty. Um, but usually this starts out just like tonsillitis, just like a sore throat. And it basically is just a abscess right there in that same spot. Okay, they can be pretty significant. I've seen a couple that are like three or four centimeters wide, and they they can deplace all your airway structures to one side, and that's what gives all the issues. So you can get strider. Um, patients have difficulty um, swallowing, handling their secretions, things like that. They might be sitting forward in the tripod or the you know kind of uh, airway protective position just because of that's alleviating the obstruction there. Um, the most severe complication, of course, is airway compromise, but it's pretty rare for these. We don't see a lot of these with airway compromise. What we'll do in the ER actually is a needle aspiration of this. Um, it can be kind of kind of hairy because there are some important structures, as you see, right around this area. Um, most importantly, the carotid artery, you know, like a half centimeter behind it. So you always got to be careful when you're going in and sticking a needle anywhere in this area. Um, but we do this sometimes. Also, patients need IV antibiotics. A lot of times they're transferred to UAB for ENT evaluation to come down and, and see them. All right, mandible dislocations. Um, so these are from various causes. Most of the times I've seen these as people that are just uh, recurrent dislocators, whether they have a TMJ issue or what. They can be spontaneous from just yawning or trying to take a big bite of something. You can get a spontaneous dislocation. Sometimes they're caused by trauma, although most, most of the time when they're caused by trauma, you're going to have a fracture associated with it as well. Um, but you can kind of see it. Sometimes it's not all this obvious, but patients will have their mouth kind of, you know, a couple centimeters open and they just can't, can't talk, can't move their mouth at all. That's usually what I've seen when these patients come in. It's really a clinical diagnosis unless you're suspecting some type of trauma, then we'll get CT imaging to make sure there's not a fracture associated with it as well. So it's always important to any kind of facial trauma to assess for malocclusion or alignment of the teeth because that can give you a hint of whether there's a fracture or a dislocation going on. So this is what we do to reduce it in the ER. A lot of these uh, patients will require sedation for this, but we actually um, a lot of these dislocations are anterior dislocations, so we kind of press forward on the back of the jaw and kind of scoop it back under and place it back in the, the correct TMJ spot back here. Um, and then can send patients home after this. Usually patients are pretty distraught. I mean, if you think about it, if, you're, if your jaw is stuck up and that could be pretty nerve and, you know, anxiety invoking. Um, let's talk about retropharyngeal abscess. You may have heard of this before in um, children, especially for some reason, get it more common. Um, there is a potential space right in front of the vertebral column that tracks all the way down uh, behind the esophagus. Um, and this space communicates with the tonsillar area and some of the posterior molars as well. So if you get an infection up here, it can track down in those potential spaces. And the bad part is the space can go all the way to the base of the skull or all the way down into the mediastinum. So the, 
the the infection can just track one way or the other, and that's why it's they can be uh, uh, deadly. The classic presentation you'll see with this is that um, there'll be a, a patient that said, yeah, I ate some fish, you know, a week ago and I felt like I got a fish bone stuck and the fish bone will actually perforate just a little and create a pocket of infection then it tracks down. Or you'll have a kid that like was running and then fell onto a popsicle stick in their mouth and it jabs into the back of their throat and it causes an injury that way and then you'll get infection down into this space. Usually you'll see kids and patients sitting forward with their neck extended because again that's kind of alleviating the airway obstruction that they're having so that's pretty classic for for this this is an x-ray view but you can also see kind of a wide area in front of the the vertebrae there they'll have throat pain neck pain sometimes strider if it's severe enough and the swelling is large enough this is uh, again treated with antibiotics and then we'll call our ent specialist and they'll actually have to go to or and drain these sometimes if they're if they're large enough uh, and like I said before, it can track into the mediastinum and get infection around the heart and cause pericarditis and be deadly if it does that. So that's why it's important to think about. All right, so this is a pretty pretty high yield topic. Um, you know, we see we see croup a lot, especially in the the fall and the winter months. Okay, so this is a, a kid usually between six months and three years of age that is having some respiratory distress and uh, can be having strider as well. It's really important to differentiate strider versus wheezing. Um, it can be hard to differentiate sometimes, but it's really important and it's something we do immediately when a patient comes into the ER. Because one, it tells us what the cause is, and two, it tells us what our management is, okay? Because it's, it's kind of, you know, two diverging paths, okay? If it's in strider issue, it's going to be upper airway, and you'll hear um, kind of a higher pitched tone. It's usually inspiratory and expiratory, and sometimes, or most of the time, you can hear it without even a stethoscope. You can just hear it with the patient in the room. Now, wheezing, of course, is going to be lower airways. It's going to be less easy to hear without a stethoscope, and that's going to indicate more lower airway disease. So there's two very differentiating points there, okay? But again, a kid six months to three years of age, they might have had some URI-type symptoms for two or three days, and now they're just having a lot of respiratory distress. They're having this strider, this weird noise they're making with their mouth, patient, uh, patients' families will describe. Um, there is a peak in second year of life, and then, of course, everybody knows about the harsh barking that you'll hear with this and that's really just because the top part of the uh, trachea is closed to the point that when you're making those forceful expirations with cough you're hearing that loud noise and all you're really hearing is exaggerated strider while they're coughing that's what you hear all right so racemic epi is the choice for moderate to severe uh, cases of croup so these aren't these aren't the kids that you know they're having little uri type symptoms and and you know they're just they're kind of coughing occasionally these, these are patients that they're, they're having strider a lot of the time, okay? They're having strider at rest, they're using um, accessory muscles, they're having a retractions uh, in between their ribs, intercostal retractions when they're breathing. So these are the, the kids you want to go with the racemic epi, okay? Because this can really correct it and can correct it uh, pretty quickly. Um, again, it, it can be diff hard to determine, you know, whether you have a small kid that is having bronchiolitis um, or a kid that's having croup, uh, but in this case, albuterol is really not going to help at all. So you really want to jump to racemic epi for strider. Always jump to racemic epi for strider and albuterol for other wheezing lower airway conditions, okay? Again, we talked about it, the signs of moderate to severe, you're going to have strider at rest is a big thing. That's also something we look for in the ER after we after we've treated. If they're still having strider at rest after treatment, then we'll have to keep them in the hospital. Other times, these kids, after some steroids and a, a couple doses or a dose of racemic epi, are fine and they can go home. Um, retractions, they'll get agitated uh, real easily just because of the work of breathing and the respiratory distress they're having. All right, epiglottitis, this is a pretty severe condition. We really don't see it a lot anymore. The reason we don't see it a lot is because the, the main cause in the past was Haemophilus influenza, which everybody is vaccinated for now. So you can still get this from some of the other common um, uh, bacteria like uh, strep pneumo and things like that, but we really don't see it as often as we did. So as you can see here on the bottom, we have a normal kind of pediatric ep uh, epiglottis and kind of the normal curvature, and then you can see the vocal cords through here. And then up top, we have a case of epi epiglottitis. You can see it's red, angry, it's swollen, it's pretty much shut, okay? And you can imagine trying to intubate that. It's not going to go well, right? Um, so these kids uh, will present very acutely. They'll be very toxic appearing. 
And that'll be the really thing that differentiates this from other things, right? These kids are going to be super sick looking, okay? They're going to be sitting in that tripod position. They won't let you sit them flat at all because when you sit them flat, that epiglottis just collapses and they're not able to breathe at all. So these kids will be sitting forward um, and they'll kind of get angry if you try to mess with them at all because they're just their body has found that one spot where there's, you know, a millimeter of open air going through the epiglottis. So that's where they're going to stay, right? Um, it can progress very rapidly. Um, like I said, the vaccination against H flu is really decreased the incidence. So we don't see it as much, thankfully. Uh, presentation is very rapid and it can progress to stride and respiratory stress quickly. Um, so we try to keep these kids as calm as possible. You know, we try to limit IV sticks and stuff like that in the field because anything that makes them anxious and agitated, it's going to just increase all the edema and swelling in the in the around the throat and the glottis. Um, so the management of this, if it gets bad enough that they need intubation, is in the this needs intubation in an OR with anesthesia, with all your resources available to do you know a surgical airway if needed. Okay. When they come into the ER, we don't like to mess with these either. We call everybody in and go to the OR just because it is that difficult of an airway and we have to have all the resources available if possible. OK, um, you can give racemic epi as well for these. Uh, it's, it doesn't help as much as, you know, with something like crew, but it can help a little bit and it can bridge you at least enough to get you to the ER without the patients desatting. So important topic, but we really don't see it that much anymore. All right, so this is what I was talking about earlier. This is Ludwig's angina. Uh, the, this is the most fear complication of a, a, a donogenic a, a infection. So you have a tooth infection and it can spread and basically it just fills up the whole potential space under the mouth. So it goes under the tongue, it can track up under the mandible. You can see it tracking down into the neck some. Um, these are pretty, uh, you know, the presentations are pretty significant like this. OK, you can see the, the tongue kind of elevated, the double tongue sign, which we talked about earlier. Um, the patients will be uh, present in trismus, they'll have that hot potato voice just because the tongue's elevated and pressing on the posterior glottic structures. Um, you know, respiratory stress, stride or cyanosis, those things are all late findings. So if you see those, it's going to be an indication that the patient's going to need a definitive airway and usually sooner rather than later. Uh, obviously, there's going to be difficult airways, right? Because all your anatomy is distorted. I, like in this guy, there's really not even an oral cavity anymore. It's He's breathing through his nose, whatever he's breathing, and his whole oral cavity is just filled up with infection. And this is another one kind of example that you'll see kind of the fullness under the mouth is a big indicator. Um, and you'll see people sometimes they won't even be able to close their mouth. It can be pretty significant. Uh, the These require IV antibiotics. However, the, it takes a while for the swelling to go down. It takes a week or so for the swelling to go down. So sometimes these patients just have to be intubated and kept on the vent for a while until the swelling goes down. And then sometimes the NT will go and drain them as well if they're, if they're significant or if there's a pocket for them to drain. All right, we'll talk about post-tonsillectomy bleeding. It's fairly common. It's a well-known complication for tonsillectomy. It can be pretty severe and it can be deadly in certain cases, okay? So it's important to know. Um, the, you know, right after the surgery, one to two days, there can be a little scant bleeding around the site. This white eschar looking material on both sides is pretty normal. For the, the bed of the tonsils after they take it out. Um, the really bad bleeding you get to, into is really about five to ten days after the actual tonsillectomy because that's when the the eschar breaks off and then you're actually you know sometimes eroded through one of the major vessels back there and the bleeding can be pretty significant okay. Um, can be fatal. Um, the airway is the biggest thing right so they're going to be bleeding profusely. They might re require transfusions but maintaining the airway is the biggest thing. And of course, these are in kids, so it's going to be, you know, they're not going to tolerate a lot of interventions as well. Um, so what we do is um, try to apply direct pressure as much as possible. We'll get the long forceps and gauze on them and actually put pressure on the side. We try to push away from the side. Um, don't, you know, we, we try not to stay away from the midline because that'll cause gagging. So if we can kind of press against that pillar on the left, that can cause bleeding. Um, we give these kids sedation up front with ketamine to keep them breathing, but kind of to keep, you know, make them able to tolerate the, the pressure back there. And then we just call ENT to get in there and they have to either take them to the OR. Or sometimes they can do bedside cautery, things like that. But that, that can be, these can be pretty dramatic. <clears throat> All right, angioedema. So this is what we were talking about earlier. This is actually swelling of the mucosal surfaces. It's similar to urticaria or hives. 
uh, except that it's a, a, a more deeper level. So this is below the dermis rather than the epidermis. You won't see rash as much with this. You'll just see this kind of diffuse swelling that's, that can be very dramatic. Uh, again, this can be this can have potential for airway deterioration pretty quickly. Um, there's a couple different kinds. There's a hereditary angioedema, which is uh, caused by a, a genetic disorder that causes a lack of a certain enzyme that causes this. Um, but the most common kind you'll see is acquired angioedema, and that's usually acquired by um, using ACE inhibitors is the biggest thing you see. Okay, so. And it doesn't have to be right when they start ACE inhibitors, okay? It can be, yeah, I've been on ACE inhibitor for five years and then all of a sudden this started happening, okay? That's, that's well, well described in literature that this happens well after initiation. Um, the bad thing with this is there's not a lot of things you can do. So your normal, you know, anaphylaxis, urticaria things, antihistamines, epinephrine, steroids, those don't help at all with this, okay? Because it's a totally different mechanism. Um, so the biggest thing is just to control the airway and stop the offending drugs and then let the body kind of get rid of it on its own. Um, the difficult part is, though, that the swelling can be bad enough where you have to intubate them and they have to stay intubated for two or three days until the swelling goes down. So Benadryl is not a way to do that, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chances are, if you run a call on somebody like that, yeah, they're going to get it. They're going to already have that yeah. drill. And, and that's totally fine. Like, you know, in, in the cases, especially where they're really bad, in the ER, we're going to kind of throw a bunch of stuff at them too, right? So we might we might throw steroids because, you know, nothing's black and white medicine, right? So even if they come in like this, if, you know, you might be questioning, well, is this, you know, maybe this is a little anaphylaxis too. So sometimes we'll even throw epi at them and, and other things, racemic epi, but if it this is. Hurt, that's your Okay. It's totally not, yeah, it's not really going to hurt, I would say, um, you know, unless you have a 90 year old guy with a, a bunch of heart conditions right. and you don't want to give epi right. to, that might be the only thing you would be worried about. But otherwise, no, Benadryl is not going to hurt, any histamine is probably not going to hurt him. Um, but I just wanted to let y'all know that it's not really going to help it either. So how long does it usually last? I don't know exactly. My, what I've seen before is um, the bad ones that have to be intubated, it'll say like after three, four days. Now some, they'll just get a little lip involvement and we'll watch in the ER for, you know, four to six hours. And if there's no other um, progression, we'll just discharge them and give them really good strict term cautions to, hey, if you have any more tongue swelling to come back to the ER. Um, but it's a whole spectrum, right? So some people just have a little lip involvement. Some people have the whole tongue and whole airway involvement. So this is a, uh... This mechanism you're describing with ACE inhibitors yes. resulting in angioedema, that's what's also known as anaphylactoid reaction. Yes, anaphylactoid meaning it's it's not the same mechanism as anaphylaxis, but it's it can present similar. That's kind of all anaphylactoid means. But yeah, it's it's a buildup. The ACE inhibitors cause a, a buildup of a substance, bradykinin, which causes a release of all this. But this is not this is not histamine release like anaphylaxis is. So other than the lisinopril's the ACE inhibitors. Mm -hmm. Is there anything other group of drugs that can cause this? Uh, do y'all know any other? What's so, the? So TPA has been shown to cause this as well, kind of the same pathway. It's more common in people that take a ACE and then get TPA. They'll get this angioedema as well. So, which is actually probably a pretty large group of people, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I don't know if y'all heard that, but we were talking about TPA um, can cause it as well. There is a drug you can give for it. It's pretty expensive. Not a lot of places have it. Um, I can't even remember the name of it right now. Alcoc what is the drug? Ikaban. Yeah, which is just a, it's a C1 esterase replacement. So C1 esterase is the enzyme that you're lacking that causes all of this. Um, so you can actually replace that enzyme, but again, it doesn't work as quickly. All right, here's another example in a, in a kid. All right, so common trach issues. There's a there's a lot about trach complications we can talk about. It's a whole topic in Excel, but I just want to I just wanted to pick out the most common things that we see in the pre-hospital setting and uh, involving uh, trachs. Um, it's good to know just the basic anatomy of a trach. So you have up top here is the is the outer cannula. It's the big kind of plastic portion, and it's got the um, the bulb on it as well. Um, they make cuffed and cuffless trachs. The patients that are sent to nursing homes that 
um, have trachs for long, longer periods of time, usually don't have a cuff. Um, the ones that require vent have to have a cuff because you think about it, you can't get positive pressure ventilation without a cuff because the air will just seep back around it. Um, and then you have the second piece in the middle is the inner cannula. All that is is a device that goes inside the outer cannula so you can take it out and clean it, right? So it can get clogged, you can take it out quickly, inspect it and clean it if you need it. And then the bottom piece is the obturator, which goes inside the other two pieces, and that is only for when you're actually placing the trach, and that is to keep uh, any kind of tissue damage while you're placing the trach. Um, there's a lot of different kinds and brands and sizes, um, but really if you just know the basic anatomy of a trach right here, that'll help you out a good bit when you're having trach issues. So mucus plugging in a trach, it happens pretty commonly. Um, these, these patients, just because, you know, the airway is not designed to have a, a opening to the area right there. Um, so you get a lot of infections and the, the body just doesn't like it. So it tries to heal it up and it tries to heal around the tray. So you get all kinds of secretions constantly with these, okay? They can clog, you can have mucus plugging that comes up from the inner portion of the lungs that clog it as well. So the first thing of course is try to suction, uh, suction the trachea out and then you can take out the inner cannula, right? So that's why the inner cannula is there. You can take it out and expect it and try to clean it out if, if you need to. Um, you know, malposition trachs will get called for a lot. We're, we're not going to be replacing the trachs usually in the field, right? Because there's a lot of complications that can arise. Um, if, if it's a newer trach, you can create a false passageway uh, while you're trying to place it. So, um, but, but we get called for, or EMS gets called for this a lot of times that, hey, my trach popped out, came out, whatever. Um, what we'll do in the ER is we'll determine, you know, how long the trach's been in, why was the trach placed, that can be helpful, and then we can ultimately try to replace the trach if, if everything looks appropriate. Most of the patients, if they've had a trach for a while, their stoma will be uh, pretty, you know, formalized, so they can tolerate being without a trach pretty well if you just kind of sit them up and try to keep them calm. They usually do pretty well without having to have it immediately replaced. Um, the, snow, the stoma, even if it's a chronic formalized granulated stoma, it can still start closing up within four to six hours of trach removal, okay? That's just the body trying to heal itself. So it is important to get these people transported and, and get to definitive management where they can get it placed back in if it's needed. Uh, trach bleeding, so, so trach bleeding, it can, it can either be not a big deal or it can be terrible, right? So you can have some bleeding around the trach side, around the stoma, that's usually, um, you know, uh, handled easily with just direct pressure, so maybe we'll cauterize a little bit of it in the ER. Uh, the big one I wanted to talk about, as you'll see, is the life-threatening bleed that, that everybody is always worried about is this tracheonominate fistula. So if you can see in this picture, the, the trachea sits right behind some, you know, important vessels here, right? So you get the aortic, uh, aortic arch coming across, you got the subclavian, and you got this anominate or brachiocephalic, so what it's also called there. Uh, in the middle and it sits right over the trachea. So if you have a trachea that's either malpositioned or it doesn't fit right, it can basically the tip of it will have pressure on the tracheal wall and over time that'll cause necrosis through that wall and then it'll eventually erode into whatever other structures are beside it. So the most feared complication is if you get erosion into that artery right there that's sitting right on top of it, uh, the anominate artery, and you can have a tracheoanominate fistula and these will present life-threatening bleeding, just huge hemoptysis, and that's just because that artery is bleeding right into the trach. So these can be pretty deadly pretty quickly. Um, they usually occur about one to three weeks after initial trach placement because that's about the time it takes for it to erode into the artery there. Um, first line treatment in the field, I would say, is to overinflate the cuff. So if it's a cuff trach, you can overinflate it and that'll try to tamponade it off. In the ER, we'll immediately call the ENT specialist down. There's a couple different techniques. We can try to pull up the trach and press it against the sternum and that'll tamponade that artery off. Um, but these can be pretty bad pretty quickly. All right, so intubating trach patients, I just wanna put this in there. If, if, if there's ever a need for a, a trach patient, usually you can still intubate from above if there's a trach issue or there's other respiratory distress issue. Of course, if, if a patient has a trach that's working and it's cuffed, you can always do positive pressure through the trach itself. But if for some reason there's a trach issue, then you can intubate from above, usually. Um, the one caveat being is if the patient has a total laryngectomy, right? So a patient has head and neck cancer, their larynx is totally removed. That means that their oral cavity 
only has access to their esophagus. The oral cavity doesn't have access to the trachea anymore, so it's impossible to intubate those. Usually the, uh, the patients will be able to tell you they'll have a what's called a Larry tube, which looks like a trach, but it's a little different. It's a little larger. And one way you can know is that these patients can't uh, phonate at all, so they can't talk at all just because they have no communication. They don't have a voice box anymore, because that can be a, a clue. Um, all right, so let's end up talking about ENT trauma real quick. We'll talk about some nasal fractures, some mid-face mid fractures, mandible fractures, which are really common, and then a couple of different penetrating neck injuries at the end. So no, nasal bone fractures are very common, usually diagnosed clinically if you're not concerned about any other trauma of the face. You don't have to necessarily get a CT if you don't see any other obvious trauma. Usually not a big deal. Um, you know, the, we'll send them to the ENTs and they might reduce it just for cosmetic reasons or if they're having any kind of sinus uh, airway blockage reasons in their nose, they'll reduce them. But otherwise, these do fine. The one thing I wanted to kind of speak out about is the presence of a septal hematoma, which is something that's good for us to know in the ER. So this top picture is an example of a septal hematoma that you can have this with nose trauma or with a nasal bone fracture. It doesn't have to be a fracture necessarily. Um, but just like I was talking about with the, the ear hematoma, so this hematoma here will pull off that perichondrium from the septum, the cartilage septum, and it will disrupt the blood supply and cause necrosis. And over time, it'll actually perforate through the septum and cause uh, a, a saddle nose deformity, which is this picture down in the bottom where it's kind of pressed in um, looking, and that's the deformity. So we always look for this in a trauma patient, and we have to drain these if we see them. And again, just like the ear, we'll put in nasal packing to keep it from reaccumulating and keep the blood supply viable to the nasal septum. Mid-space fractures, fairly common, especially, you know, for... For a fracture like this involving the maxilla of Lefort fractures, it has, has to be a pretty, pretty large mechanism. Usually these are MVCs. You can see these occasionally with assaults if it's with a weapon. Um, there'll be massive swelling, distortion of the airway. The nose will be displaced sometimes, you can see. Uh, sometimes these do require airway, airway protection if they're comminuted especially. Um, and they can be more difficult because of all the swelling to the airway, the bleeding that's in the airway. Uh, one of the complications you see with this is a, CS left, a CSF leak. If a patient's had a fracture like this and then, you know, they're either managed and go home and then they come in a week later and they just say, you know, I just have this runny nose that won't go away. That can actually be CSF leaking out from the fracture itself. The mid-face maxillary fractures are classified. It's not really it's super important that you know this, but Lafort classification is just based on what the fracture is. But they can, these can, as you can see, be pretty unstable as far as the mid-face goes. <clears throat> All right, mid mandible fractures. Uh, it's the second most common fracture after nasal bone fractures. So you'll see these a lot with assaults, assaults especially. Um, sometimes MBC, sometimes falls, and the elderly can have it. Again, you can see some airway issues if they're comminuted and you have, you know, like a free floating segment of, of chin or, or anterior portion of the mandible. Um, the airway can be an issue. This is a bandage that you could use in a pre-hospital setting just to get, it's more for like pain and alleviation from the patient because if they're unstable, they're gonna be flopping around everywhere. Um, so you can do this bandage and it'll hold up and stabilize the mandible as well. A lot of these will, will require surgical involvement if they're open, um, not always emergently, but most of the time they'll, they'll need surgery for these. Uh, penetrating neck injuries, we'll talk about the zones of the neck real quick. This can be a you know, wide variety of injuries, whether it's the stabbing, GSW, and you know the, the neck is a high real estate area, right? So you got airway issues, you got vessel issues, um, you have the spine, of course, in the back. So a lot of high real estate. So any injury to the neck can be pretty, pretty severe. So these are the different zones of the neck, uh, especially for trauma, penetrating trauma purposes. Zone one is at the bottom. And we'll talk about each one in the in the area. Zone one is from the clavicles to the thyroid cartilage. Uh, you have carotid arteries, thoracic vessels. Uh, a lot of people don't think about it, but your your lung apices, you know, will come up pretty high to your traps up here. So you can have pneumothorax. It's pretty easy with these. Um, I think it's up to like 10 percent, 15 percent of zone one neck injuries will have a pneumothorax as well. Zone two is the cricoid to the angle of the mandible. You have all the you know, structures you would classically think of in the neck, your carotid arteries, your jugular veins, your spine, of course, in the back, your larynx, your esophagus in the middle, all those can be injured. 
And then zone three is the angle of the mandible to the skull base. Um, usually uh, these are not as much involved with vessel injuries, but you can see them. The distal carotids will come up even though they get closer to the skull when you get this far up. But you can have more uh, pharynx injuries. You can have an airway issue if you have a, a communication between the wound itself and the airway, it can cause an issue. This just matters more for like the trauma surgeons because it'll determine whether they want to go in and do a surgery and explore the wound based off which zone it is. <clears throat> so initial management, of course, airway, airway, airway in these. Also bleeding is a big issue, right? So you can exsanguinate if you have a jugular injury or carotid injury and you can die quicker from that than you can from losing an airway in these patients. Um, always remember pneumothoraces in these, especially if it's a zone one injury. So if you need to decompress the chest, decompress the chest. As you can see here, they have done anticipate difficult everything, right? So anticipate a difficult airway. Uh, BVM might be difficult if you have face trauma as well. Um, video laryngoscope is very helpful in the case, this case. I mean, any any trauma video laryngoscope is helpful for, but especially in these cases, if you have a, if you have a you know, if you think there's a laryngeal injury or the airway, or the airway anatomy is just going to be distorted or not uh, in a normal anatomic position, it can be an issue. If you see massive sanguination bleeding from the neck, of course, direct pressure, but you don't want to occlude the airway. Um, you know, it can be difficult, but you also don't want to occlude the carotid artery all the way because then that's just going to cause somebody to stroke out on that side of the brain. Um, so they can be difficult, but direct pressure is still the first thing to go to. All right, I think that's actually all I had. So we can take questions now. If you have any specific questions, like I said, it's not comprehensive ENT, but kind of some of the bigger topics that I thought would be helpful for the pre-hospital setting. So uh, one thing that, that comes to mind is occasionally we get patients who call 911 for dental emergencies. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've mm -hmm. had different responses from different emergency departments and different positions. One of the responses that we've gotten over the years is, hey, we don't do dental work here, what you bring them here for. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them are, are more welcoming. Mm -hmm. But what uh, what dental uh, what dental type emergencies really do need to go to the ER? Like what level of abscess is a true emergency? Yeah. Obviously, loot 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 the big infection things would be the biggest thing I would think of. So, if you have a large enough infection that would cause an airway issue, those would actually be true emergencies. Yeah, you know, like in, any ER is, is going to take in anybody that comes in, right? So anybody that comes in and wants to be seen, we're going to see. But the actual true emergencies, I would think, would be uh, an angioedema, blood wigs, angina, any big infections, anaphylaxis, croup, things like that. For dental stuff, dental infections with facial swelling is always concerning because you don't know how big that abscess is. It can always transition to blood wigs. Because dental abscesses are what lead to Ludwig's in most of the cases. Um, so those are big things. Any ER can manage, you know, fractured teeth, dental pain, infections. If the patient is high risk, they have diabetes or older, history of strokes, can't control secretions, things like that, they should probably go in. But we also all know in the state of Alabama, if they want to go to the ER with any complaint, yeah. they're going to get there. Right. Yeah. I guess my question is really, um, I guess it's an isolated uh, broken tooth, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. kid falls. Is it is it better for them just to go to the dentist? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I would say yes. If they want to go to the ER, that's fine. But because what we're going to do is just put paste on it and then send them to the dentist. Yeah. Right. So, or just call the dentist. Yeah. This yeah. is probably Captain Obvious, but no. that would probably have to do with the uh, mechanism of injury on the thing for the for the fracture. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you exactly. Device. Yeah, exactly. You it, might have some other stuff if you're, on. you know, concerned for abuse, of course, if there's if you're concerned for any other trauma, neck trauma, things like right. that. It's kind of like anything, like if it's just like a broken tooth. Yeah, they just didn't strike. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Quick fix it, take it to the dentist. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah it's just a judgment. problem, you know, fix it and then send them to their primary care. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And yeah. just remember, if you think about a lot of the dental fractures that I see, or people who are intoxicated with some substance and have fallen and break their teeth. And just remember, those folks, even though the complaint may just be dental stuff, yeah. do a quick assessment to make sure they don't have a, you know, a rib fracture, a clavicle fracture, yeah. a big head back, something else like that is going to. Yeah. Or they're cirrhotic and altered and fail. Yeah. But I'm just complaining of it too, you know. Yeah. So on the <clears throat> on the issue of a dislodged trach. Oh yeah. Um, 
So we get those occasionally. Yeah. Um, is there any a time, would there ever be a time where you would introduce an ET tube into the stoma to try to yeah. fix that problem? Yeah, yeah. If so, so if the patient's an extremist, and like I said, especially the laryngectomy patients where you can't intubate from the top, then of course, and you can try, kind of treat it as a crack at that point. Yeah, you want to say anything else about that? Like in general, I did, I don't know, a lot. I did that on my uh, 12 year old. She had like a bunch of uh, congenital problems. Yeah, but the cardiac arrest, but her trach was out. Yeah, yeah, so cardiac, yeah, cardiac arrest. Perfect. Yeah, cardiac arrest is great. So, like, if the patient's an extremist, of course. Okay. Yeah. Because the, the only the problem is, you know, creating a false track. But if the patient's an extremist and, or cardiac arrest, of course, then that's. Yeah, you know, I just, because yeah, like, I didn't want to waste time. Yeah. Going yeah, trying to look from the top. You, you kind of treat, you can't make the hole, but if the hole's there, right. exactly. you treat it like a, that's your oral airway. Yeah, yeah. Um, Perfect. How close is the average stoma to the corona? I mean, do you have a lot of break yet to work No, I think, I actually looked, I think it's like three centimeters, three yeah. to four centimeters. So it's really close. It's easy, yeah, it's easy to, to write main stem these, especially. You just got to remember that when you're putting them in, yeah. So it's going to look kind of weird sticking out the ET tube. Yeah. Is. But if you got to ventilate somebody and they don't have a cuffed trach tube, you got to put a cuff in there. Every time you bag them, it's air's going to come back. Yeah. It's not going to do anything. The scary ones are the ones for fresh trachs. So the guy who had a trach done last week, and you show up to his house and he's caught that thing out and he's got this big bloody hole there gurgling. What do you do with that? Mm -hmm. Those guys are high risk for getting a false lumen if you shove the tube back in there. Like Dr. Payne said, if they have respiratory distress, can't control the secretions, you have no choice. That tube goes back in there. Yeah. This has come up a couple of times at the regional uh, level because there's not a protocol for medics to do that. Yeah. But we should be ready to make, manage that airway anyway. So, I mean, risk to benefit, they're going to dial and get a tube shut back in the cell. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I think that covered all the questions that came in. Yeah. I had a couple of things just to kind of add if that's okay. So things to think about with the nosebleeds, a differential diagnosis, can we call it, things that could be going on besides a nosebleed. Um, you know, you think about somebody could be having <coughs> massive upper GI bleeds and vomiting and then the blood's in their nose. So don't always say, oh, it's just a nosebleed, not a big deal. Think about that. And I've also seen people with pulmonary hemorrhages who are coughing up blood, kind of gag it, and it comes out the nose as well. So I always think worst case scenario when you manage that. Dr. Payne mentioned, Payne mentioned we use tongue blading sometimes to kind of pinch the nose. That's great in the hospital, works good. In the field, you're not going to have a lot of tongue blades. Things that might work is a closed pin, something like that, right? Some way just to get direct pressure on those people. Um, we also, he also mentioned the use of TXA. So obviously we talk about TXA a lot. It's the drug of the decade. It can be used for lots of things. There is no protocol for TXA for nosebleeds, for dental bleeds, things like that. But just like magnesium was years ago, you can still call it med control and get it used for asthma. Now it's in the protocols, right? So if you got somebody with massive nose bleeds, it doesn't get better, or a dental extraction that's bleeding, you want to try to nebulize some TXA, call med control. Tell them what you want. If they give it to you, great. If they don't, that's fine. Reach out to me and we'll talk to them and hopefully get some things changed. So you can do that. Yeah, we do all have atomizers now for nasal administration of Narcan. Exactly. So you can do that. If you're going to give somebody TXA intranasally, the problem is that if they're pouring the blood out, it's tough to get the TXA on the mucosa, right? Um, so you, my experience is you're better off putting TXA on a packing material and pack it, which you really, guys really can't do. But direct pressure is good and maybe nebulized TXA or something like that. You would not want to use Combat galls or quick cut galls on our nose. I would not shove that in someone's nose. Yeah. No, so just like for clarity. In general, right? Like you don't do combat galls on the face. I probably would not. Yeah. yeah. Now, if somebody had an open neck wound that was like pulsating, I would get my hands in there pretty quick, direct pressure, and I'd pack because they're going to die pretty quick if you don't control that hemorrhage. Uh, other thing I wanted to kind of mention uh, kids with a strider, um, nebulized. Uh, receiving epi is reasonable. The other thing you want to do is start moving them toward the hospital in a very nice, pleasant manner. If they get agitated, they're going to get worse. So you don't fight them, hold them down to give them a neb treatment, right? Because it make them worse. Um, if you don't carry racemic epi premixed, can you make your own? Yes, you can make your own. So the folks out there in the internet land listening, if you don't have the pre-made uh, racemic epi, not a big deal. There are different ways to make it. I would do one to 1,000 epi and put 
uh, one milligram, half a milligram in a nebulized solution with three or four cc's of saline and go to town with that. A lot of ways to make it, but you can make your own. That's all I got. Awesome. Excellent job. Thank you, sir. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, we're going to take a break for a few minutes and come back with uh, Dr. Evans. Um, please remember to fill out an attendance form. Yeah, listening online, you can find a link to the attendance form in the chat box, or you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated reply and a link to the attendance form. The password for today's form is poison. Word poison. Yeah. We'll be back here in just a few minutes with Dr. Evans. Yeah. Hey everybody, welcome back. We've got uh, Dr. Joel Evans from UAB here. He's going to talk to us about uh, toxicology. I just have to <laughs> get a little get a little monster uh, swig before we start. All right. So uh, first things first, to answer a question that came over, somebody was curious what a Rhino rocket was, or at least there was a Rhino rocket question mark on there. A Rhino rocket is essentially just a packing device that we put either air or saline in. For lack of a better way of putting it, it looks originally like a tampon and you put it in the nose and then you inflate it again you can use air saline i like saline for a bunch of reasons um, but it has impregnated galls on it and can help tamponade the bleeding off so that's what a rhino rocket is y'all won't have them in the field but we have them in the er all right so we'll kind of run through some of these pretty quickly um, if you've seen my lectures i like to do case-based stuff and we'll talk a little bit toxicology is a really really big uh, subject We've got a couple of really good toxicologists as at UAB, Will Rushton, Suki Ati. They run the, the Poison Control Center for the state of Alabama. So they are well versed in this. We get a lot of it, but um, we're just going to go over a few things here. So general patient care pearls when you talk about overdoses and poisonings. Um, when you have an overdose or a poisoning, again, again, if you've heard my lectures, my number one thing is always your safety. The scene has to be safe for you to go in. So if there's any question about that, if it's we don't know what it is, if it's a quote unquote meth lab or something like that, make sure somebody has secured the scene first. And usually that's going to be law enforcement to make sure nobody's there to hurt you. And then, of course, a lot of the fire departments that y'all are well versed in scene safety with with respect to like meth lab and stuff like that. Um, but it is very helpful from the EMS side to determine what particular agents are involved the time of the ingestion exposure because it's actually going to dictate their care if I know exactly when they took it uh, and the amount ingestion ingested. So if you can bring empty pill bottles to the receiving facility so you get on scene, see a patient laying there, there's a bottle beside them. Don't just come and say, hey, there was a bottle beside their body. Bring it to me so I can kind of figure out what it might have been. Otherwise, we're just going to be chasing our tail a little bit, but that'll be very, very helpful. So everything starts with BLS. Make sure the airway is good. If you need cervical spinal mobilization, there's evidence of severe trauma. By all means, go for that. Um, supplemental oxygen is needed to maintain a SAT over 92. Again, that's kind of been, we're not going for 100 anymore. Monitor vital signs. Don't give them anything by mouth um, because we don't know. Some of the ingestants can actually, is very caustic to the airway. Um, so we want to be very careful what we give them. And then ALS becomes much more broad, right? So this is a very busy slide. I apologize for that. The big things with most ingestions is supportive care from the EMS and from the, frankly, from the emergency medicine side. It's if they need an airway or they need ventilatory support, give them that. Okay. Always get a cardiac strip on these guys. If they're obtunded or altered at all, make sure you get a blood sugar. Even not just the laying in the floor, snoring respirations, but even the super delirious guys it might just be a blood sugar issue so I always try to get a blood sugar on these guys as well and then so monitor o2 as you need it in title co2 um, give them fluids if they're hypotensive so and then this side it goes over a bunch of different things so dextrose if you need it um, glucagon glucagon is yes for sugar but it's also an antidote for a couple poisonings as well so we'll go over that all right, if there's any questions whatsoever, always can call the Poison Control Center. I think most trucks have it readily available. You can even Google it, but the number is 
always across the country, it is 800-222-1222. And what you'll get is you'll get the, it'll route with your phone to the local um, poison control center. The one that gets a little bit weird is if you're in like Southwest Alabama, there's not a small chance that you get Jacksonville, Florida. You might not, but sometimes it reroutes a weird way just depending on your location. So you may not get an Alabama Poison Control Center, but you should. This is, a, again, a really busy slide, but I think this is probably one of the more important slides that I can give you. So we're actually going to go over this one. So when you think about toxidromes, when you think about poisonings and toxicities, this is not an all-inclusive list, but this is a lot of the real common stuff that we see. So we're going to go over this, and it goes over what's the change in heart rate, blood pressure, respirations, temperature, their pupils, bowel sounds. It's usually a loud scene. If you can hear bowel sounds, great. If most of y'all are like me, which I know Chief Ward is, we're deaf because we've done this a long time. And then you can also see the diaphoresis part, big sweating. So anticholinergics, these are your things like they've got a scopolamine patch. Um, Benadryl is a very strong anticholinergic. Um, a lot of your antihistamines, a lot of your um, things that you'll see over the counter in allergy pills, like not just Benadryl, but Tylenol, cold and allergy or sinus and allergy. Anyway, so in overdoses, this will cause your heart rate to go up, your blood pressure to go up. Your respiration is not going to do a lot to that. It's not like your opiates that depress. But heart rate, blood pressure go up, your pupils get huge, your bowel sounds diminish, but you're dry. So the big difference between this and like a meth toxicity, meth, they're sweaty like crazy, their pupils are still really big, but just think about everything is amped up in an anticholinergic. The only weird thing is they're dry, okay? So big pupils, tacky, they're kind of crazy, but they're dry. Think about anticholinergics, okay? A cholinergic, and these are just, when I talk about these, these are just receptors. So we could get into the weeds about the receptors and what they're hitting, but I just want y'all to kind of know some of the words right now. So cholinergic, these are your uh, organophosphate poisoning. So you go out to a farm or you go to a true green truck and they've had an exposure of pesticides just kind of blow up in their face. It's not uncommon, give or take, in our area. Um, much more common in other parts of the world. But for cholinergic, these are the guys that, it's called sludge, so they're profusely just tears. They have uh, tons of oral secretions. They're peeing and pooping on themselves. But it doesn't do anything too much at, at the beginning to their heart rate and blood pressure. At some point, it will cause severe bradycardia. But in initial, you're not going to see many changes in their heart rate, respirations, temperature. But their pupils will be pinpoint. Their bowel sounds will be crazy, as you would expect if they're pooping all over themselves. And they're really, really sweaty. So basically, if you go to a patient, it's this, it's got the right pattern. They're they're working with phosphates, they're they're a farmer, and all of a sudden they're wet everywhere and they're pooping all over themselves, that would be something to worry about. And we're not gonna go over the treatment for that, but the treatment for that is atropine. First decontaminate them, get them in your truck, and then atropine is needed for heart rate issues. But get them on to the hospital because we've got some other antidotes we can give. Opioids, everybody's really familiar with this. This is, you can have a little bradycardia, definitely respiratory depression. They're cool. Everything, just imagine the body is now shutting down and depressed. So they're cool. Their heart rate and blood pressure can go down. Their respirations go way down. Um, pupils are pinpoint. Vowel sounds are absent, but they're dry. Okay, so the difference between these two is wet versus dry. So this diaphoresis really does become into a big play to help clue you in. Sympathomimetic, this is your caffeine which you can't overdose on. Uh, cocaine, amphetamines, Ritalin, Adderall, you name it. Anything that jacks up the system, we call it sympathomimetic. Another thing I do want to add into here is ketamine and then a couple of the others, um, like MDMA, so that's ecstasy. So heart rate, blood pressure goes up, respirations go up, they're hot as all get out, their pupils are really big. Their bowel sounds are crazy, and then they're sweaty, okay? And then sedative to hypnotic, these are the things like your anti-anxieties, um, your barbiturates, your muscle relaxants, again, things that are going to depress the system, depresses everything. The only difference is they're dry. So this is real similar to opioid. The only difference is you shouldn't see a pupillary change, okay?
I know that's a busy slide, hard to see. I just at least you can look this up on Google. This is just one that's very important when you get on scene and you don't know what they took because the treatment is very different for each one of those. All right, so let's jump into cases. So case number one, you get called to just man down. You don't know a whole lot extra, but you get on scene. It's a rural location. It's a private house. There's really only the man and his girlfriend there. The victim is a one, uh, is, there you have a single victim, 25 year old male found unresponsive, has an empty pill bottle nearby in his hand. Your only historian is the patient's girlfriend. So you find a few pills next to the patient. You find the bottle's pretty much empty. Girlfriend states they had a big fight. She came home and found him like this and immediately called 911. Um, does have a history of depression, and this is the medicine he just filled. If you'll notice, it's amitriptyline, 50 milligrams. He had 50 pills, and it was filled today. Okay. So again, I know I know now how many should have been in there, and it'll also tell you how to take it. So you can kind of calculate how many should have been in there, how many he may have taken, because again, that's a big, big deal on some of these poisonings. Does anybody know what amitriptyline is? So it's a tricyclic antidepressant. All right, somebody's already already getting there. So you do your primary survey. Level of consciousness: this guy is unresponsive. He is unconscious. His airways open, but he's got saliva. He's gurgling. So I wouldn't say he's got a good airway right now. Respirations are ten. He's he's sonorous, meaning he's just snoring. Uh, he has a di diminished gag reflex. So before I go any further. I've got issues, right? So we're going to keep moving on, but I know I've got to prepare to do what to this guy if I don't make him better very shortly. Intubate. Intubate. So his, that's not a good airway. Even though his respirations are okay-ish at 10, his, his GCS is way less than eight. And with a snore, uh, snoring and gurgling, it's not a very good airway. So circulation, his pulse is rapid, but it is weak. It is weak because... Blood pressure 70 over 40, heart rate is 140. We're right now, we're bagging the patient. We've suctioned his airway, we're bagging the patient. We're getting an O2 stat that is rising, but it was, it was low to start with. Now, now here's where we get into the toxidrome side. If, even if you don't know what amitriptyline or Elevil is, he's dry, he's flushed, there's no track marks. So he doesn't look like a big opiate user, but you can, you can use it a bunch of different ways. That's just another clue. Pupils are dilated, so we think this is opiate now. Probably not. They should be pinpoint if this was an opiate issue. Um, no evidence of head trauma, of course, we don't know because nobody witnessed him go down. Um, lungs clear and equal is, is regular rate and rhythm. Abdomen is decreased bowel sounds. So at this point, what do you want to do for this guy? So we've talked about snorous respirations. He's got an airway that's not so great. With the GCS, it's minimal. Um, O2 is crappy. Yeah, I would absolutely throw him on the cardiac monitor. You've got blood pressure issues. And I would take care of his airway. You are not wrong. So you place him on the cardiac monitor. You're not wrong to start giving him some medicines to try to help with his breathing as you're doing a lot of this. So place him on the cardiac monitor. This is what you see. Somebody can shout out, what is that? That is VTAC. So VTAC, we've already talked about this as a tricyclic. So this is a tricyclic antidepressant overdose. The antidote, what's the antidote of treatment? You, truckload of sodium bicarb. And we'll go over why sodium bicarb in a minute. But yep, the antidote for this is sodium bicarb. So when you get tricyclics, this is kind of a weird one. This is not like opiates where I'm just going to expect, expect a couple things to happen, like respiratory depression, just general depression in the body. This is, it kind of goes through a range of things in the body. So with tricyclics, you have about four things that happen with them, four different toxidromes that happen with one drug. You get the anticholinergic problems, so they can get very hot. They can get blurred vision. Obviously, this guy has no vision, uh, but very dry, flushed skin but it can cause tachycardia and seizures. So this one, the anticholinergic part of it, ramps up certain parts of the body, so you have to worry about seizures, hyperthermia. So that's a big issue. 
this quinidine-like sodium channel blockade is what just caused us to go into VTAC. So basically, with your heart, you've got a couple different channels that are really important. You've got sodium channels, which is the electrical conduction issue, and then you've got calcium channels, which is the muscle contraction issue. And we'll go over the, both of those in this whole lecture. So the sodium channel blockade is here is why we give sodium bicarb. I'm not giving him so much for the bicarb, I'm giving it for the sodium, okay? So when you have sodium channel blockade, now your heart's not squeezing very well, you get a prolonged QT, and just like long QT syndrome that widens out, widens out, widens out, widens out, now I devolve into torsades or VTAC, which can go even further into V-fib asystole if we don't treat it right. And then of course, if the heart's not pumping right, you're gonna get hypotension, and then all the dysrhythmias we just kind of talked about. So that's, a, that's the most major issue here that will kill the patient, okay? Alpha adenergic blockade, meaning you've got alpha in your blood vessels that keep them constricted. So if I block those, well now I get hypotension just from the vasodilation. And then antihistamine side, you take a bunch of Benadryl, what normally happens to you, you get super sleepy, okay? So would a, would a normal saline fluid bolus be indicated for these patients? Yes, yes for a couple reasons. So they're super dry, they can't control their temperature very well. I wouldn't want you to flood four liters in them because their heart's probably not pumping very well, but you've got to get some volume in the vasculature. So it's just like sepsis, right? Sepsis, it's all about the vasculature is dilated. Well, same thing here, it's the vasculature is dilated, but we need to get some volume in there to kind of help re restore that. Any role for pressure? Yes. If, if you can't get this, I don't, with the sodium channel, channel blockade, yeah, I mean, it's one of those where dopamine will give you some inotropy, it'll give you some vasoconstriction, so dopamine would be a good choice in this one. However, if you've got the sodium channel blockade, I don't know how effective it's gonna be until you get more sodium in their body. So this is, yeah, if you're way out there, give them fluids, start thinking about dopamine. I got a weird look from Ferg, so I think he was just yawning. That would be fantastic. If you could, I think you've just made your million dollar idea right there. So for a person in that situation, dopamine would be better than say push dose epis. Push dose epis, not bad. You know, anything that's gonna give you contractility as well as vasoconstriction. So epi and dopamine are actually really good in these. Um, I like dopamine because pretty much everybody carries it. It's, we talk about it a lot in the EMS world. Um, everybody has had epi too. Don't get me wrong. Um, yeah, I like dopamine in these, but ep again, epi is good. This would not be a case if you're transporting somebody between hospitals for norepi or levofit. Doesn't give you the contractility. All right, we'll speed up just a little bit here. So when you talk about tricyclic antidepressant, again, we're going to talk about if it's, you just took it just a little bit, just a few pills, you might get some sinus tech, a little slurred speech, their mouth's really dry, they may be a little sleepy. From This is all from the anticholinergic side of this, really dry, kind of sleepy. But when you take too much, you go into coma, you have seizures, dysrhythmias, and hypotension, which is where this guy lands. They can rapidly, if you don't know how much they took, they can rapidly go from this to this in the matter of just the transport. So if there's any question, put them on the monitor, monitor them very closely during transport, even if your transport is 10 minutes. So can we predict who on these patients will go to severe toxicity? We don't know anything else, don't know how much you took. There's something you have in the back of the truck that he's already on that can tell us. We've got him on a cardiac monitor, right? When you, get, when you do his EKG, so the thing that we use in the emergency department that Russian kind of taught all of our residents is the QRS length. All right, so normal is 0.12, right? So 120 milliseconds. But what he wants us to do, if there's concern for heavy toxicity, and we see that QRS in most people, so a good normal heart is less than 0.2, but most of them are less than 100 milliseconds. If we see their, their QT, or I'm sorry, their QRS widen out beyond 100 milliseconds, and you start to see it march out, that's a really heavy toxicity. So they're gonna need a lot of stuff really fast. Okay. Most of the time it's high flow diesel, but be ready with your sodium bicarb, but go ahead and have it by you. Okay. Uh, it might just be um, specific to my experience, but it seems like the tricyclics are kind of making a comeback. 
Do you feel like they're more common now than they were? Yeah, so in the, in the psychiatry world, they went a long time. They, they didn't prescribe it a lot because it had a lot of issues. But now it's making a flip, and I've seen for, I don't know, for a couple of years, I didn't see hardly any Elevil or amitriptyline. But now I'm seeing it for a lot. I'm seeing it for headaches. You know, it's not just a depressed person. Chronic, chronic pain management. Chronic right? pain management. So they're using amitriptyline a lot for a bunch of different things, not just depressed people. In 1985, the Elevil, the amitriptyline, the tricyclics kind of went away from depression because SSRIs came into being. Protax. Right, they kind of all the tricyclics kind of went away. But like I said, they're back now for chronic pain, for headaches, for anxiety. You see it used a lot in elderly people for chronic pain as well. So it's it's pretty common. Yeah. And and the elderly is also kind of concerning in this because they don't have much of a reserve. They're dry baseline, so they can get real sick with these really fast. Even taking normal doses, they have a clearance <laughs> issue from they didn't drink enough and their kidneys not filtering it out well. So. Just something to think about. I'm kind of beat that dead horse. So these are a bunch of your antidepressants and your tricyclics. Your tricyclics are here. A lot of them end in amine. Okay. So amitriptyline is the one weird one. Clopyramine, imipyramine. Big list. Don't worry so much about it other than just know it's there. So if you ever have a question, just Google on your phone. We all have phones now. You can just Google and say, I don't know what this is. I'll let you tricyclic. We need to worry about some stuff. Pre-hospital management, we've already talked a lot about this. BLS support, ALS support. If it's seizures, treat them as a seizure, okay? You're going to give them a bunch of benzos, okay? The big thing is if you are if you get a wide complex QRS, and now in the emergency department, if I knew they took it and they start to widen out beyond 100 milliseconds, I'm going to start them on sodium bicarb. In the truck, you can start thinking about it. Definitely if you get wider than 0.12, then you're going to give them sodium bicarb at one mil equivalent per kilogram IV. Okay. Honestly, what you've got in the trucks, 50 to 100, just give them 50 to 100. I'd give them 100. We're in Alabama, so everybody's like me, kind of hefty. You can repeat in five or 10 minutes. And if it's torsades, and it's obviously torsades, you can do mag. But again, the treatment, the antidote is sodium bicarb, which is cat B. All right. Any questions on case number one? Cool. We kind of beat that dead horse. I'm sorry. I'll speed up a little bit. Case number two, you got a man in custody, possible injection. It's coming from a traffic stop on the side of 431. So patient states or police and patient states that, hey, I pulled him over and all of a sudden he threw a bag in his mouth and he just started swallowing a bunch of rocks. All right. So now the patient's really, really agitated by the time you get there. He's diaphoretic. He feels pretty shaky. So before we even know anything else, seeing that, what toxidrome do you think we're sitting in? What do you think you may have? Sympathomimetic. So that's probably either crack cocaine or some ice or methamphetamine. Okay. Primary survey, he's alert, anxious, agitated. Everything else looks okay. Um, he's got a bounding rapid pulse. Bottle signs, he's significantly hypertensive, tachycardic. He's breathing 30 times a minute but doesn't appear in severe distress other than he's super anxious and just really agitated. Skin, his clothes are completely wet with sweat. Everything else is good. H-E and T, it says clear, but he does have large pupils. All right, everything else. This is his EKG. I'll just go ahead, just for sake of time, this is sinus tac. And so what's the antidote or treatment for these guys? Sympathomimetics. You get crack, somebody's super high on crack, they're going wild, bucking, going crazy, meth, whatever. So a better question is, how are you going to manage these patients in the ambulance? Same brain for I probably wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to... <laughs> So a lot of the a lot of uh, drug abusers do have a concomitant psych issue, but the answer is I actually would not give ketamine to these guys. These are the ones I wouldn't. So ketamine is a good excited delirium medicine. We use it a lot. We're well familiar with it. These are the guys I would not give it to. And the point being, the, the antidote is benzos. It's benzos, 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 more benzos. And when you have another question, it's more benzos. Okay. 
you're trying to tamp down the sympathetic response that they already have going on in their body. Ketamine has a sympathetic surge associated with that. That's why they maintain a drive. That's why when you give ketamine, sometimes you'll see the heart rate and the blood pressure go up a little bit. So on these guys that already have their, their body is being flooded with adrenaline from the drug, I don't really want to give them any more of that. If you, I would give them probably Haldol or I would give them, I would call online medical control and get orders for benzos. Versed is really good. It's pretty quick acting. Um, it's, it would be an online medical control answer because it's off label use in the EMS world from what your protocols say. But any reasonable doc would give you that way over ketamine in this case. Okay. So I've always loved this patient acting up. They take a ride on Atomy. All right. So here are some of your sympathomimetics. So notice ketamine's in here because it does, you know, shoot up the, the sympathetic surge, but it's crack. It's amphetamine. Synthetic marijuana is a big one. Um, ephedrine, people on diet pills, caffeine. There are some, you know, there was a big issue. I won't say big issue, but there was an issue when I was in college about kids found caffeine powder, which is really hyper concentrated. And we're talking not just my monster that has 160 milligrams. They were talking thousand milligrams, 2000 milligrams. So that would be an issue. The other one that's a little bit weird, but that's kind of making a little bit of a comeback is dextromethorphan. That's the pill city way of saying it, not the Cajun way of saying it, sir. It's called Skittles robo tripping. And what that is, that's the cough suppressant in cough syrup. Well, if you, it's got a couple different ways. So it's dose dependent. You take a little bit of it kind of to a moderate dose, you're going to get euphoria, feel pretty high. You'll get kind of agitated a little bit. You take a hefty dose of it and it goes the opposite way. It becomes more of an opiate toxidrone. So they get really lethargic. Um, they get real somnolent from it. Okay. But again, dose dependent, it's, it's kind of decent sized doses. They get real happy and dissociative and they go kind of crazy on you. Okay. So that's one to think about. That is more, much more of a young person's way to do things. Sympathomimetic toxidrome, again, it's really big pupils. They're agitated. They get some arrhythmias, usually sinus tachycardia. Um, some chest pain can be associated with it because of all the sympathetic surge. Sweating, seizure, hyperthermia. Okay. So really, honestly, treat the agitation and you treat it with benzos. Okay. This is one that we talk about. It's kind of theoretical, but don't give them pure beta blockers. You would not do that in the truck, but definitely don't give these people beta blockers. And the whole point is it would be unopposed alpha constriction. So we talked about earlier, you have alpha receptors in your blood, in your bloodstream, in your vessels. Those constrict. You got beta receptors that open it up. So if I block the beta receptors, I have nothing to open up my vessels, and you'll give alpha constriction. Again, it's theoretical. We do it and we, we treat these people all the time, but something to think about. All right, pre-hospital management, you got the BLS stuff we've already talked about, and then your benzos are your big deal. So even though they're wild, try to get a blood sugar. It could be a glycemic crisis. You never know. Any altered patient needs to have a blood sugar. They're usually not going to need an advanced airway or airway support other than they're so amped up they might breathe 50 times a minute. So when you're given this first set, just watch the airway really closely. All right, your safety's number one concern, like we're always gonna talk about. So if he's going nuts and you can't safely put him in the back of your truck, don't ride single rescuer to the hospital if they're going nuts. I don't want y'all to get hurt. Get them controlled before you leave the scene. If, that's, if that takes five guys riding to hold them down or give them a bunch of meds, either one, just be safe. Okay. Hey Doc, is it is it common for these, these folks and moderate to severe uh, levels of toxicity to become hypoglycemic? It can actually. So kind of weird thing. So you'll initially get a bunch of sugar surge. It's the stress response from your body. But if they've been like this for a while, they've used up all the reserves. Think about you not going to eat, but you worked out for six hours. That's what their body's essentially doing. So you can burn through your sugar reserves pretty quick. So initially that will be high, but over some time, if they've been in it a while, it can be hypoglycemia. All right. Treat this again. Sodium bicarb is something you can use in these if their QRS starts to widen out, especially in cocaine. Cocaine is another sodium channel blocker and it'll make that QRS widen out. Methamphetamine, not so much, but cocaine specifically and crack um, can give you those wide complex dysrhythmias like VTAC, torsades. OK. All right. Case number three. We've got about 20 minutes, so I'll try to move through these. 
Man found down behind a local nightclub. It's called Rave Times. One patient, you don't really have anything other than his friend says, yeah, he's, he was been in the club. He's not really a drinker, but I went looking for him and we found him behind here. He's, he was kind of talking with these other people and they were doing some rave shots, but that's all I know. Okay. So before we go any further, he's unresponsive. He's in the back of a club called Rave Times. Is there any drug that's going around now that y'all could think of would be? Is that GHB? That'd be GHB. Yeah. So he's unresponsive, snoring, vomiting on the ground. He's breathing once a year, and then but has a regular rapid pulse. No track marks. No, his HENT exam. He's normal cephalic atraumatic. Pupils are equal, reactive, sluggish a little bit. So up to hunting. Thoughts? I agree. This is GHB. So you're thinking GHB, but you don't know. There, you can be take. You could technically have taken a lot of different drugs at this point that causes this, right? Um, not wrong in anybody that has respiratory depression to give them Narcan. Is it going to hurt them? No, it's not. We can talk about the the theory, the issues with giving a chronic opiate user who's overdosed a big slug of Narcan. That's a different ball game. This is just if they're not breathing, do this and then move on to your next stuff. Okay. Narcan trumps dextrose in most cases. So you put an oral airway in, he didn't have a gag, so it's time to take his airway from him. Okay, so you intubate him for his airway protection. That is not a patent airway. He's not breathing effectively. Patient's intubated, being ventilated. Uh, when you get to the ED, Dr. Ferguson meets you in the room and he says, you know, rave time's been in a really bad place for uh, GHB lately. Okay, so Crazy enough, these patients actually, if you control their airway, they do pretty stinking well. And they will wake up within three to six hours and they will pull the tube. And so it becomes fun to fight those while you're trying to get the tube safely out. So yeah, this is GHB. It's called Liquid G Water Floor Cleaner. Surprisingly enough, is it can be broken down in the body to GHB compounds. So well, floor, not floor cleaner, but floor stripper. Well, I don't want to give away too many secrets, but yeah, this is this is the class where we don't teach you how to make meth, but we will show you meth. Um, but no floor stripper that is y'all need to know that because if you find somebody down and there's a bottle of floor stripper and they ain't working on the floors in here, then that could be a big issue. Um, that's kind of for whatever reason in the last year or two, that's kind of been an issue. Um, so it's called gamma hydroxybutyrate first developed as an anesthetic in 62. Bodybuilders in the 80s liked it because they thought it would in, increase their GH levels. It really doesn't promote muscle growth. They thought it did, but it really doesn't. But that used to be a big thing with them. But now it's more of just, it's just a rave drug. It's people take it to get high, to have a good time, because in very small doses, you'll get the euphoria and kind of dissociative window. Um, but because it is also, it's called water, right? Water's tasteless, water's odorless. It's clear, you can't detect it. It's also a big date rape drug. So may or may not have been an issue recently at a couple clubs. So. It seems like we went through a big uh, surge of this late 90s, early 2000s maybe um, in the area. And it seemed like it kind of disappeared for a long time, but we have had a few cases recently. So in that earlier experience, it seemed like the bad cases were always associated when they mixed it with alcohol so yeah. is alcohol a big potentiator of the effects it, it is so if you think about what alcohol is going to do to you it depresses your system and it's it's a lot like this so this actually is a good segue for this particular slide so ghb crosses the blood brain barrier really really well it binds to your gaba b receptors gaba think about gaba reducing your consciousness gaba a is what alcohol and benzos act on. So again, AB doesn't matter, they're still GABA. So if you get two things working together to depress your, your system, you're gonna get really intoxicated and probably apneic really fast. So yeah, alcohol being a co-ingestant is really bad. Okay. Um, and then it alters the release of other neurotransmitters. This is kind of why people do it. So it leads to lessens your inhibition. You get kind of stimulating the reward center of the dopamine in your brain. Again, if you take really small, that's why people do the little capfuls as opposed to taking slugs of it. Okay. 
So this is kind of the dose related effect. It really doesn't matter because by the time you get called and you see them, they're going to be more in this side of super drowsy, going to sleep. Or they say, hey, I was out with my girlfriends. Yeah, a guy bought me a drink. And next thing I know, I woke up in the bathroom. I don't really know anything else. OK. Um, death secondary to just pure overdose is fairly rare, but this, the severe respiratory depression, that's the issue. So the guy y'all found, if, if nobody got to him, he could have had a big issue. OK, but it's rare because most people are trying to stay in this range if they do it intentionally. But if somebody walked by and poured a ton in their drink, then that could be a big issue. OK, so typical expected course. This is one that's really helpful for y'all. Onset of effects is within five to 15 minutes, so it's actually pretty rapidly acting. So you can think about somebody's at a bar, somebody buys them a drink. This is what terrifies me as a dad with a daughter. Somebody buys them a drink, hands them a drink within 15, 20 minutes. This is taking effect. So effects can last three to six hours, which is the part we'll talk about in a minute. You'll get rapid decrease in your consciousness. But these patients, even though they're comatose, noxious stimuli can wake them up. These are the ones that are completely out and you go to move them and they start swinging. And you say, what the crap? And you put them back down and they go back apneic again. That's what these guys look like, okay? So when you move them around, just take care. Make sure you've got control of their hands and things like that. Don't let them hit you, thinking that they're just comatose, okay? Management, it's honestly, it's all supportive. It's manage their airway. These guys will almost always get better. So like we talked about, if it's airway depression, give them Narcan. If it doesn't work and you need to get an airway, go ahead and get it. Um, assist their respirations. Bradycardia can occur, and you need to get an EKG on anybody that you suspect is a toxicity, any overdose whatsoever. Um, but these are really just monitor the airway and then they should do fine. Because what's going to happen, uh, don't forget your blood sugar, assess for traumatic causes. But what's going to happen is it's usually going to wear off in six hours. So the last two I've intubated in the ER, they came in completely obtunded, apneic. They weren't breathing at all. We intubated and then it became three hours, I think three or four hours later, we're saying, hey doc, I can't sedate him. Like he's really coming alive. He's grabbing at his tube. All right, well it's time to get the tube out. So they, when they come alive, they will come alive and they'll pull your tube and they'll get everything out of the way. So just be, re just be aware of that. But there's no test for it. There's no way we can figure it out. We've got two more cases, but we may only be able to get to this one, which is okay. Um, this is one that's really important to us specifically. Uh, Five-year-old male got into his grandmother's pill case. They think he took some, they just don't really know what. He, you get there, he's alert, crying, doesn't really like to be around strangers, which is normal for a five-year-old. Um, but yeah, his grandmother's pill box is there. And you start asking the grandmother, well, what was in there? I don't know my meds, but I got high blood pressure and I got cholesterol, I got gouch. You know, I don't really know what's in there though. Okay. So one thing, I'm not so worried about a high cholesterol pill. I'm not so worried about a gout pill for the most part. I do worry about with a kid in these these blood pressure pills. Some of them are really, really big deals. So he's crying, he's consolable, airways intact, brachial pulse is palpable, they're normal. Um, these are his initial vital signs. Just in the interest of time, these are normal for a kid. So it looks like a low blood pressure. That's perfectly normal for a five-year-old. So mother says, hey, I want to go to the children's hospital. That's very appropriate. If there's any question that the child licked the pill, there's any question at all, it's always better to take the child to the hospital. Nearest hospital is great. Children's is fantastic if you're in Birmingham. Um, but kind of while you're in transport, you get out here on 59 or 459, there's, there's a wreck. You cannot get by. You're just stuck. Well, during transport, he becomes much more somnolent. You're repeating his vital signs. Well, now you know his blood pressure is 80 over 50. Pulse is 43. Respirations are down a little bit, but they're, they're okay-ish. You say, okay, well, let me check his blood sugar. Well, it's 108. That's not the problem. Okay. So seeing a pulse and your blood pressure go down, you got any thoughts of what type of blood pressure medicine this might be? Could be a beta blocker. Beta, so the two are beta or calcium channel blockers. Either one of those will do this to you. And fun thing is we're going to treat them real similarly. So here's the EKG you get. Not so good. Severe bradycardia. That also honestly look a little bit more like a third degree. Okay. 
So when you get this particular one is a calcium channel blocker overdose. You found out later that the grandmother takes amlodipine, which in kids that is the most concerning one. Okay, calcium channel blocker and beta blockers give you bradycardia through AV blockade. Uh, you get hypotension with it. Obviously, your heart's not pumping very well, and then because of that, you'll get altered mental status, and then you could have hyper or hyper hypoglycemia in these. So just monitor their blood sugar really closely. Some examples of your beta blockers, they end in olol. So metoprolol, atenolol, propanolol, carvedilol. These three are the most common pure beta blockers. Carvedilol is a little bit different. And then your calcium channel blockers usually end in ipine. Amlodipine, philodipine, nicardipine. Then you have diltiazem, which doesn't fit, but that's a calcium channel blocker as well. All right. So the, with these, again, very concerning overdoses. BLS, just make sure the airway is patent, support the airway as needed. If it's a child, I'm probably not going to jump to intubation unless I have to. Children do really well with just bag, mal, bag valve masks, um, especially if you don't have a ton of transport time. Now, if you're transporting super long, so be it. The ALS side of this is frequent vital signs, EKG, and I would do constant three lead. I'd probably repeat the 12 lead on a regular basis. And then establish an IV fluid, uh, IV to give them fluids if they're hypotensive, which a lot of these will be. So specific therapy when you talk about beta and calcium channel and beta blockers, you got your standard ACLS stuff. So their heart rate's down, you're gonna give them atropine. Probably not gonna work just because the way this toxicity works, it's already blocked all the channels my atropine's gonna try to work on. But you can give it, that is perfectly fine. Um, transcutaneous pacing is absolutely something I would do in these kids if they're hypotensive. Um, so immediately go to that as needed. And dopamine and epinephrine, like we've already talked about, um, that'll increase the contractility as well as the rate and give you blood pressure control, as, uh, improve blood pressure as well. Apparently my monster is kicking in. <clears throat> but so that's, that's standard ACLS. That's what you're going to do in the truck to anybody that has these symptoms, even in an overdose or out of an overdose. The toxicology side is, this is gonna be hospital side. There are some things that you can give in the truck. This is gonna be more hospital side. High dose pressor, so I'm gonna give them that dopamine, that epinephrine for the contractility and the, to shrink their vessels down. I'm gonna give them a lot of glucagon. So what you give in the truck is one milligram IV. I'm gonna give five to 10 milligrams IV and see, see if we can help with that. And then I'm going to give them calcium because it's a calcium channel blocker. So now I'm fighting with that. I'm, I'm throwing as much calcium in their system to try to get to the heart as I can. Okay. So again, these are specific doses for you. Atropine, it's, point, it's a half milligram for adults. Peds, remember they're, do, they're different. It's weight based. So it's 0.02 mg per kg. You can do it times two. It's probably not going to work, but by all means, definitely try it. Um, calcium chloride. Again, we're just throwing a bunch of calcium in their system. These are the doses there. That's a cat B drug. And then glucagon. Again, you're given a milligram. When we get to the ED, it's going to be three milligrams. Or I'm also going to give them high dose insulin. And I'm, I'm flooding their system with sugar to try to offload some of that, that beta blockade. And then again, transcutaneous patient, honestly, is going to be probably the mainstay. Heart rate's in the toilet. They have no blood pressure. Pay some as you're getting ready for all the rest of this stuff. Okay. And then call med control. If all that's even the transcutaneous space is not working, now we need to throw some dopamine or epinephrine in there for them. Okay. So there's some pearls. In children, it is very, very important that even a minor ingestion or even a question of ingestion, they need to go to the hospital. The reason being, we're going to watch them. A lot of these calcium channel blockers, you'll have kids, they don't taste very good apparently. We go to children's and they'll lick the pill a lot, or they'll spit it right out. We'll say, oh, well, he's, he licked it, but he spit it out. I don't think he got any. Okay, that's fine. But we're going to watch them for probably four to six hours to make sure that they don't have the cardiac issues and the blood pressure issues. If everything looks good, they can go home. The one that cannot go home, even if they lick the tablet, is amlodipine, because it stays in your system for about 24 hours. That's why I'm saying that it's not that it does anything worse than these other things. It just lasts so much longer. That's why that one's so much more concerning for us. 
So amlodipine questionable injections always get admitted. End of story. Okay. Um, the normal ACLS efforts such as atropine will likely be ineffective. Transcutaneous pacing should work for your heart rate. But again, you have beta blockade in your, in, you have the other channels in your vessels too. So even if you get your heart working really well, your vessels may have issues. Okay. So they may be dilated, especially in calcium channel blockade. So you may have to move on and do your epinephrine and your dopamine. Monitor them really closely. And then again, transcutaneous pacing and vasopressor agents are the big mainstay here. Okay. I think I can get through this last case in just a couple minutes. All right. This is one that you're going to see a lot throughout your entire career. It's a 23 year old female found in her dorm room. She's depressed, crying after breaking up with her boyfriend earlier in the day. You find a bottle of non prescription sleeping pills. It's empty right next to her bedside. He says, you know, I don't know how many I took. I just I don't want to be here anymore. I'm done. OK, so you look at the bottle. It's Tylenol PM. OK. There's about 50 in the bottle. So we and then so now's where it becomes. This is super important. When did she take it? Because my treatment's going to be based on time. My treatment's going to be based on amount. So knowing when she took it, how much she took is very important. So you see Tylenol, you're thinking, oh, that's Tylenol overdose. Um, this actually has a lot of Tylenol in it. It's 500 milligrams per tab. So if we do the math, she took 25 grams of Tylenol. The normal dose for us, if we just took some, the normal safe dose is four grams a day, okay? The Benadryl is also a really concern inside of this. If it was just Tylenol, all right, we're, we're okay. We know things are gonna happen, but it's a little more delayed. But she's got actually a lot of Benadryl on board. And do y'all remember which toxidrome that fits in? Anticholinergic, right. So that's gonna be something that in the real short term, you gotta worry about during transport. This, there's not a lot you can do about that in transport. This one, you got to worry about a couple other things. All right, so acetaminophen Tylenol, again, the maximum safe dose is four grams per day for adults, 75 milligrams per kilogram for kids. Toxic dose is 10 grams. So you take 10 grams, you, you're going to kill your liver. Well, she took 25 grams. It's a big difference. Or, and that's over a single dose or, or 24 hour period. Or if they're a chronic Tylenol guy or girl, and they take over six grams a day, for a couple days straight, and that's a big issue too. We use something called the 150 rule. Doesn't matter. I just like for y'all to hear it. Nothing that'll work mean much to you in the pre-hospital setting, but toxic dose, if you want to calculate it, it's 150 milligrams per kilogram. We're going to use NAC, which is the antidote, at 150 micrograms per milliliter, and then the loading dose is 150. So in my mind, if I just know the number 150, I'm going to know pretty much everything I need to start with on the Tylenol people. Okay. Acetaminophen is highly hepatotoxic. It is going to kill your liver, but it's going to do so slowly. So these people that take it say, oh, I'm, I'm killing myself. Well, you might, but it's going to be a painful four days. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to be a quick issue that you thought. So the phase one, less than 24 hours, you're going to get some nausea, vomiting. They're not going to want to eat. Their stomach's just really upset. Phase two is the one to three day mark. Now's where stuff starts to happen if we don't intervene on them really quickly. Now their liver's starting to get affected. The liver enzymes are going to start shooting up. They're going to start having pain now. They won't have pain usually that first day. But starting day one to three, they'll start having a lot of pain. By day three to four, now their organs are starting to shut down. You get all the buildup of the metabolites. And usually in that first week is when if they're going to pass away, they're going to pass away then. OK, phase four is just a recovery. If you make it out of that first week, probably going to do OK. You might have some liver issues long term, but especially if we can give you the antidote, which is NAC, NAC, if we give you that pretty quickly, then probably do OK. All right. And the reason we're going after NAC again, I'm not getting into the weeds, but NAP key, you get this when you take Tylenol, it causes a buildup of a toxic metabolite in your blood, and that's what starts to kill your liver. Well, NAC works against that toxic metabolite and gets it out of your body, so it doesn't cause you issues. So pre-hospital management on these people, transport safely to the clear, quickly to the nearest property D, be concerned for other co-ingestants. So if they took one thing, they may have taken another thing. Well, this 
She took one pill but had two things in it. Okay. Used to, long time ago, we would give activated charcoal to these folks, especially if it was really early on in the ingestion. It's not even on the truck anymore. So, and even in the emergency department, it's there's a very, very, very limited role for activated charcoal. Um, she might actually get some in the ER if it was quick enough that I could get to her to bind this, but in all honesty, it's going to cause much issues. And if you've ever given it, it's a mess. Like you are, you are black from head to toe for a while, especially if they vomit on you. All right, this is in, a, in acetylcysteine. This is your knack. Again, it just detoxifies that, that big problem with the liver. I used to study these in med school, so it would help me remember. It's just funny, weird things. But the anticholinergic side, the diphenhydramine, is the actual big issue. Um, lots of them actually have anticholinergics. These are a big list of drugs. But when we talk about it, you'll hear a lot of people talk about mad as a hare. So they get really, really confused, really altered. They're blind as a bat. They can't see. They're red as a beach. Their skin becomes really flushed, really dry. They're Again, dry as a bone. So dry as a bone, red as a beet is all hot, dry skin. So mad as a hatter, blind as a bat, red as a beet, dry as a bone are kind of the biggest thing, and hot as a desert. So these are the real dry, hyperthermic, confused people that actually could have some, they can get so confused, they get real delirious and try to fight you a little bit too. So she took something, she's really depressed, but during transport, she might get a little wild. These are some more anticholinergics. You can do it through drugs. You can also do it through Jimson weed is something that people will see in out kind of in the boonies. People will smoke it thinking that they're getting rabbit tobacco or I don't know. I'm showing my age now, but they may think that they're going to just try to smoke a weed. That's something will give you anticholinergic as well. So another thing with anticholinergics, if somebody not necessarily in a, a toxic overdose, but somebody like an old person who just takes a bunch of Benadryl, it can cause their bladder to fill up. It basically causes their bladder muscles to not work as well. And so the, it'll fill up, fill up, fill up. They can't pee. So, and it shuts down their bowels. So <laughs> what we usually say is you can't pee, you can't see. <laughs> you can't spit because you're dry and you can't so you can't pee, you can't see, you can't spit, you can't. Pfft. I'll let Ferg say the rest of it. All right. What was that again? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's actually recorded. This is pretty awesome. So pre-hospital is all really just, again, supportive care. It's starting IVs. There's a toxidrome, so you're going to make sure you get an EKG. Um, and these patients will get really hot, really fast, really agitated, so just watch them. Again, because everything's getting agitated and ramped up, we would prefer not to give them ketamine, right? Because that's another sympathomimetic. So again, benzos is another one that's going to be really helpful in these patients. Okay. My big thing to just make sure people know, and this is this is the end of the lecture, um, is if they're hyped up and amped up and you think it's drug related, that might not be the person that gets ketamine from me. Now again, your safety is paramount. It, you do what you got to do, but if you can, I'd prefer you to call and say, hey, man, I think this person is sympathomimetic, which would be a good word to use for one of our docs just because they'd be like, oh, okay, I'm, sounds good. Um, but you could even say, I think they're super high on meth. They're agitated. I cannot safely get them in the truck, but they cannot refuse. I don't want to give them ketamine. Do you mind if I give them Versed, Ativan, whatever? Any reasonable doc is going to tell you, yeah, because it's going to be the better for that patient. Just to give you an idea, some of these sympathomimetics, I've had to give 30 milligrams of Versed to these guys before. I wouldn't advise doing that in a pre-hospital, but I mean, it, it gets to that point where you just, you give them benzos until they stop. And you got to manage their airways sometimes, but it happens. Any questions? I know that was a lot thrown at you pretty quick, but. Is uh, NAC, is the trade name for that, is that mucomist or is that? It is, it is. So there's an oral form, there's an inhaled form, which is mucomist, and then there's the IV. We're all going more to the IV stuff now. So if you ever smell it, it smells awful. Actually, you can throw it up and give it to an IV. Exactly. It smells awful, tastes awful. So imagine smelling and eating rotten eggs. That's 
but that's the other side of it. So just a couple things I wanted to add. Uh, I think Dr. Evans mentioned that there's been a big rash of weird drugs, GHB issues, and also some long-acting opiate use. There was a, uh, in the greater Birmingham area, there were four patients brought to a local facility that got Narcan. Um, normally, we watch them about four hours after that to get Narcan, make sure they don't rebound. Uh, we watched them four to six hours, and then all of a sudden, a couple of them went atnic at the six to eight hour mark. They were there longer because they had co-ingestions. But the point is there is some long acting opiates out there. So if you give someone Narcan and they want a PRT, not go to the hospital, obviously we always ask, are you trying to kill yourself? They say, yes, they got to go to the hospital. They're just trying to get high. They can sign out, but make sure you stress there's some long acting medicines out there because the Narcan uh, may not last long enough and they could go home and die from that. It's pretty scary with that stuff going out there. Uh, the other thing, if you do give somebody ketamine because you're not sure what they're on or you got six cops holding them down, once you give the ketamine, if they're super tachycardic, super hypertensive, call and then give them the benzos. Okay. Now, obviously, that's going to be two things that decrease the respiratory drive. So get ready to manage that airway. But if they're crazy butt naked fighting people and you give ketamine because you got to give something now, and then you get them in the stretcher, you expose them, you look them up, you get vitals, and they're 220 over 120, heart rate of 140, still sweating like a dog. Yeah, give them benzos, but get ready to manage that airway. So that's it. Is being uh, buck naked and formal indication for ketamine? Uh, yes, sir, it is. Okay, yes, just check. Yes, sir. <laughs> I think buck naked is always with Florida man. Yeah. Florida men did. I feel like the sympathetic medics are usually the ones that are naked. Yes. And that's Spell City. That's not naked. That's not nude. That's naked. 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 N E K K I D. Right. Sure. What about um, Ambien toxicity, the drug Ambien? Um, we had a few of those a while back where they were large doses mixed with alcohol that we got some pretty interesting uh, psychotic reactions from. Is that. Is there anything anecdotal there or? So Ambien is one of those, it's a sleep aid, right? So if you just think about what it's intended for, so if you take it in high doses, you're going to potentially get respiratory depression, but it's like, it's almost like a ketamine style. You're going to get some sub dissociative, depends on doses, right? You take a crap ton of it, you're going to get respiratory depression, coma, but at certain levels, you get that euphoria kind of crazy side of it. Like robot tripping. Yeah, I mean, a lot like that. It's just a lot like that. Um, but those, the biggest things are, again, manage their agitation as you need to. But I would be really worried about respiratory depression, especially in a co-ingestant with alcohol. It's almost assuredly going to cause them to have a respiratory drive depression. And lots of people do co-ingestions. Nobody just goes out and just, just does their heroin, right? They're doing the heroin, the alcohol, the bit of coke, the same thing. Uh, other drugs that routinely prescribed, gabapentin, Will get people pretty altered. There are a lot of uh, muscle relaxers out in the market. There's soma still out there. There's also baclofen. So a lot of these medicines that people just mix them together and they get altered. So airway management's priority. If uh, they're still after you sedate them, it's still tachycardic, hypertensive, think some kind of sympathetic, like you said, next to that word. Sim I can't say the word. Sympathetic. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, but remember, airway management is paramount with these people. What about uh, the synthetic marijuana that we see? What is there a standard thing that is usually contained in that, or is it just whatever people get their hands but on? But in a synthetic, the thing you get over at the gas station, you genuinely don't know what's in it. That's the problem. Is all the other stuff that's in it. We just know the vast majority of the people that we get with those are sympathomimetic, at least the toxidrome. Now, I don't know what's in it because, again, everyone's different. Every single brand has something a little bit different in it. Um, but it gives you a sympathomimetic, and they get crazy. They get very wild. The guy that I gave 30 of Versed to, in all seriousness, he was a, he's a well-known synthetic weed user. You just don't know what's in there. So the other thing that somebody texted in to me was to mention, I don't know if I'm saying it right, Kratom. Kratom, yeah. Kratom that people are getting at the gas station apparently has a very opioid-like Yes. So, so the reason it's coming in, and it's not regulated yet, it's about soon it'll be regulated at the state level, so they can't sell it anymore. Um, people, I've seen people actually use it in the right way, that they're, they're basically saying, 
I've done opiates forever. I can't get on Suboxone. I can't get on all these therapies. I know Kratom will do it. And Kratom does have uh, mu opioid receptor activity. So it's essentially replacing heroin or replacing whatever. Uh, but then other people find out that they don't have to go to the doctor and lie about my neck pain or my back pain. I just go to the gas station and get my opiates. A little more convenient than finding your dealer. Down the is it actually an opiate or is it some? No, it has affinity for the mu opioid receptor. Okay. So it's just a synthetic compound that acts on that receptor. Interesting. Is it is a uh, Narcan effective if they? Yeah. Okay. Anything. So even so, like clonidine overdoses. Clonidine over. Clonidine has a very weak activity on a mu opioid receptor, which is why heavy doses of clonidine. Yeah, you'll get hypotension because that's a blood pressure pill, right? But you get respiratory depression too, and so you manage that with Narcan. Is that why it kind of sometimes do some people take that for anti-anxiety as well? Yeah. yeah. And for somebody detoxing off of, of heroin, that, that used to be a mainstay drug as well. Because they would get hypertension, yeah, but it also had a little bit of activity on that mu, so they are not quite as jonesing for a fix. It's not great, but it, it has some stuff there. Something more than nothing. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Thanks, Dr. Payne. Great lectures today. As always, thank you, Dr. First. And, uh, we appreciate the Alabama Fire College for helping to sponsor these events and Centerpoint Fire for hosting us today. Uh, please remember to put in for your uh, certificate by filling out an attendance form. If you're watching online, you can get the link in the Q&A. Otherwise, you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com, which will generate an automated response with a link to the attendance form and the password for today's attendance form is poison. No, I didn't know how to spell it, so you have to Google it. Um, Just look up Brett Michaels for the band. The court of okay. That's right. Oh, and that'll do it. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. I like them, but you'll later. We left.